Double blind test to prove a difference between two sounds is often seen by people as a way to prove me and my colleagues wrong. Let me give you my take on it. Let me first define double blind. A test where the subject is unaware of what he or she is judging is called a blind test. This is a dangerous method for the tester when in sight might give away what is played by non-verbal or other clues. Therefore the double blind test has been designed where both the subject and the tester are unaware of what stimulus is offered to the subject. These test principles are seen as good practice in many fields of science and research, although exceptions do occur. There are cases where it is considered impractical or unethical to apply, like having children grow up while being deprived of any physical contact with their parents or caretakers. Although such experiment has been done a few ages ago, supervised by a French king if I remember well, today, fortunately, it is considered unethical and a violation of human rights. Double blind tests are often performed on a larger group of subjects and the outcome is statistically analyzed. To keep the outcome conclusive, always one single identifiable item is tested amongst a larger test panel. If it is a medicine against a medical condition, one half of the test panel is giving the real medicine and the other half a placebo that looks the same but doesn't contain that or any medicine. In the end, the result in both groups is evaluated and if the difference is statistically in favor of the group that did get the medicine, it is considered to be effective. Things would become a lot more difficult if patients having several diseases and undergoing several treatments at the same time. But it still can be done, since the result is reasonably objectively measurable. It just takes a lot more effort and a very large group of subjects. I bring this up since this comes more in the direction of audio evaluation. I have mentioned this before, my wife loves to cook, hence my physique, and when we dine out she always evaluates the food. She describes how the lemon zest was a clever move to freshen up an otherwise too sweet dish or anything along those lines. I just enjoy the food and am not able to analyze the dish in that way. My wife has many years of learning, trying, making errors and so on behind her and since she loves to cook, I never cook. But when it comes to audio, she is the music lover that enjoys the music to the full without analyzing the music nor the audio in any way. That is my speciality and I have many years of, well, you get the point. But although my wife can evaluate food in any restaurant immediately, I can only detect major flaws in an audio system when not in my trusted environment and using my own review references that, by the way, are listed on the hbproject.com slash en slash about. Evaluating audio is done by subjectively quantifying a large number of sound properties. A number of properties are easily identifiable, like heavy or lack of bass, sharp highs, nasal sound and some others. You don't need to be an expert to hear these properties, just as too much or too little salt or pepper is easily identifiable or when food is burned for instance, not that that ever happens to my wife of course. More subtle properties take more time and then there is the adaption of the brain to situations. I used to love a rare steak but lost appetite for it a number of years ago. When I visited a small town in Croatia a few years ago, I ordered a steak to find that what my brain had stored as a steak was that steak that was kept frozen for a long time and travelled half the world to my supermarket and that a fresh locally produced steak in Croatia was so much better. What if I was asked to join a panel for frozen globetrot steaks prior to Croatia? I would have been far less critical and might have helped that producer to a good rating for a far from good steak. Many people today grew up with a far from good audio, positions 
far from ideal and fed with far from ideal MP3s. What if we have these people judge audio equipment? It would give a perfect picture on how the average consumer would judge the mainstream stereo. Tools for a proper evaluation has to be learned to them and even trained listeners like me and my colleagues always need to train when not in familiar settings with known equipment and known music. The difference is that we can do that quicker or easier decide to reject the test conditions, which I did more than once. As we have seen before, both the subject or subjects and the tester should not know what is playing. This means that changing the setting from situation A to B and back needs to be done remotely. When testing sources, this could be done using the two sources connected to one amplifier that is remotely controllable. To be sure the component or components between the sources and the amplifier have no influence, they should exchange places somewhere halfway the test program. The sources might, depending on the type of source, be placed outside the listening room to prevent auditive clues on what player is started. It should also be evaluated whether switching from input A to B and back is identifiable by acoustic noise. If so, the amplifier and the sources should be placed in another room. But then the long loudspeaker cables might pick up stray magnetic fields that might get in the feedback loop of the amp to have it correct errors that never were present in the amp. Reviewing loudspeakers at audiophile level this way is even more difficult since you don't want two pairs of loudspeakers placed next to each other for the playing loudspeaker will excite the non-playing loudspeaker. And in all cases there need to be someone present in the room with the subject and someone else to do the changes. For you don't want to use extra switches in between equipment. For experienced listeners, experienced in evaluating home stereo equipment in this case, things become easier when the fingerprint of artifact is known. I would relatively easy identify jitter since I know its fingerprint, which by the way doesn't mean that I always will identify all types of jitter. But identifying MQA still is difficult since I don't yet have an identifiable fingerprint of MQA, if there is any. Perhaps there are more fingerprints or perhaps the influence of the MQA mastering settings confuses me. So if I were asked to do a double blind test on MQA, I would demand the time to discover what those fingerprints are. Professor Ad Houtsma once developed a scheme that evaluates the progression of the subject and ends the test when the score doesn't further improve. These tests were performed for Philips for their DCC codec and the subjects were sound engineers from Philips Classics amongst others. Funny enough, I found the end result of the DCC codec to be agreeable while my colleague at that time didn't like it at all. And that's the next problem. When I was asked to do a double blind test and would have agreed to do that, the only thing you then know is my opinion using my auditory system with its far from standard training and experience. And as I mentioned before, even someone with the same level of training but with another physique or another history, like the colleague I mentioned, can have a different opinion. That is why double blind tests are preferably performed using a larger panel of subjects. The limitation here is the quality of the people in the panel. If you want to advise audiophiles, you better use audiophiles in the panel. If you want to advise people that have no particular interest in audio, use a panel of this group of people. There are many more arguments against using double blind testing for audio evaluation. Dolby used such a panel to prove that Dolby Digital, in essence a kind of 5 channel MP3, sounded so good that the panel could not distinguish it from linear PCM. It makes you wonder why they later developed Dolby True HD if Dolby Digital was already perfect. I would also like to mention the test panel 
that judge the DAB plus codex to be equal to MP3 128 kilobits per second. You can download the report on ebu.ch. It is far better to consider the work of me and my colleagues like the work of a good restaurant critic. There are of course critics that like every restaurant for a free meal, but there are also well respected restaurant critics. Some might like what you like, while others might have a taste that differs greatly from yours. Once you found out with what food critic you are compatible, he can guide you the way to nice restaurants and food. The same goes for the work I do. If you don't like my conclusions, that's fine. I encourage you to find a reviewer that does and stick with him. But if you find yourself to be compatible with my taste, my findings might help you further. For those that don't agree and want to have me do a double blind test, if you transfer $50,000 to me, I will hire specialists and facilities from the Dutch Research Institute TNO and do a double blind test. For all reasonable people with ears, if you want to be informed when someone will transfer 50 grand, subscribe to this channel, my newsletter or follow me on Twitter, Facebook or Google+. See the show notes for the links. If you like this video, please consider supporting the channel through Patreon so I can remain independent. As a bonus you get access to super exclusive videos too. The link is in the show notes. And don't forget to tell your friends on the web about this channel. I am Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.